personal history and life and the private life of Daniel than we do of any of the other prophets. He's introduced to us as a teenage boy, probably 15 or 17 years of age, when he was carried away as a captive, transplanted from the land of Israel, his home country, to a foreign country, to a heathen land. For over 60 years, he lived in that desolate court and pagan environment into which he had been taken with all of its spiritually deadening influences. He walked with royalty and with dignity and with purpose amidst a licentious and rakish court and society of that day. He became prime minister of two world governments, that of Babylon and that of Media Persia. He was lifted to the very highest position that any king could offer any man. He was more famous and more respected in his day than Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of England during World War I, or Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England in World War II, or John Foster Dulles, the after World War II Secretary of State 
of the United States. Daniel was much more famous than any of these men. He won the friendship of kings, and he had bitter and cruel enemies that sought his life. He was loyal and true to the pagan prince that he served. That is the thing that characterized this man. He maintained an unblemished testimony. He kept himself unspotted from the world. He walked so that no one, not even his enemies, could find any fault with him. That is, anything they could prove. They brought many charges, but they never were able to make anything stick against this man. In the sixth chapter of Daniel, the fourth verse, we read this language. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. May I say that that's a marvelous testimony for a man like Daniel to have in a foreign and a very wicked court of that day. He was faithful to God. He was an old man when a testimony came from heaven by the mouth of an angel, O man greatly beloved. What a testimony when you have reached a ripe old age not to have men down here praise you, but to have a testimony come from heaven, O man greatly beloved. That was the testimony. And the writer to the Hebrews put him in the Westminster Hall of Fame and Faith and put him there, and may I say not by name, wasn't necessary to name Daniel, because it's well known who the writer is speaking about when he says in Hebrews 11:33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. What a testimony for this man to have. And then when we come to the end of this man's life, we find the very last verse in the book of Daniel saying this concerning him, Thou shalt rest, having served God and man so faithfully. Now God says to him, Thou shalt rest. You'll now go to your rest. And not only that, he says, But you'll stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And when the time comes for the resurrection of your people, you'll be raised with them. And then you'll receive the just reward for the life that you have lived for God. I cannot conceive of any man whose life stands out like the life of Daniel. And somebody asks the question, what is the secret of this man's life? In this day when success is the mark of greatness, it doesn't make any difference today what you're in. You may be a gambler, you may be in the racehorse business, but if you make a success of it, the world will pass you today and say that you're all right. Because today we have gone overboard on this matter of success. May I say to you that Daniel was a success. And by the world's standards today, he is a success. We've just come through the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a howling failure, according to the world's standards. And God called him to stand in a dark place, in a hard place. But this man Daniel didn't stand in that kind of a place. This man stood under in the glow and publicity of a great court, and he stood yonder at the very top. May I say to you, Reader's Digest would have sent one of the editors to get an article on Daniel and his success. 
because that's the way the world measures things today. Now, what was the secret of his success? What's the key to his life? If you should ask me this morning, I think that I would express it in just one word, just one word, and that word is separation, separation. Here is a man separated to God. And I believe that that is still the door to the understanding of prophecy, is separation. And one of the reasons today that prophecy has fallen on evil days, and the reason today it's lent itself to fanaticism, and the reason today that a great many people have turned from it is because of the lives of those who proclaim it. If there's anything in the Word of God that's made clear to understand prophecy and for it to be a blessing to our own hearts and lives, it must lead to separation. I want to give you a statement of Dr. Lang, a great expositor of the Word of God of years gone by. Listen to this statement. The qualification for being a prophet is the qualification for understanding prophecy. The reader must be one with the prophet in this at least, the resolute purpose to be holy. For the immediate end of all prophecy is practical, moral. And then he quotes from 1 John 3, 3, Everyone that hath this hope set on Christ purifieth himself even as he is pure. Merely mental study of Scripture is idle. And being idle is mischievous. But if any man intendeth to do God's will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God. Therefore, as we proceed to consider the visions and messages of Daniel, let each ask himself, Am I a man of Daniel's moral purpose and resolve? If so, the Spirit of truth will open the meaning of what he showed and said to Daniel. If not, Daniel's book will remain to me a sealed book, even when the time of the end may have come. May I say to you that that is the one great requirement today for the study of prophecy, and the reason today it's dropped into so much fanaticism in Southern California is because of the fact that the one prerequisite is a life that is dedicated to Almighty God. Now, that's the thing that characterized Daniel, separation. Now, I know that the word separation has fallen on evil days, and it's been harmed today more in the house of its friends than on the outside. And right now we have two extreme groups in our midst. One group are known as extreme separationists. They are legalists, actually. They have adopted a narrow and limited code of conduct. They have reduced the Christian life to their little straitjacket. And if you don't get in it, it's going to be bad for you, my brother. They've made a set of rules. In fact, the matter is, they say that we've been delivered from the Ten Commandments and from the Mosaic Law in order that we can get under their law. And they haven't settled for Ten Commandments. Some of them have made a hundred. And if you don't follow them, it's just too bad. They are our present-day Pharisees, and they have adopted the policy of touch not, taste not, handle not. Many of these are unkind and cruel in their conduct and in judging others. They are those that are unlovely in many matters. And today they happen to be the greatest gossips that you can meet in these days. Or as the young people say, they'll chop you to pieces if you're not very careful. May I say to you that legalism certainly does not manifest the Spirit of our Lord, and it's certainly not New Testament separation. Then, my beloved, there's another group that are at the opposite extreme. They are anti-legalists, 
They come out actually from the early church. It was one of the early heresies. Antinomianism was what it was called. That is, they believe that since we're saved by grace, that we do as we please. They like the principle of grace, but they do not like the precepts of grace. There's no discipline of grace according to them, and the conduct does not count, and you do as you please. Paul's answered them, Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Those that have been saved are not to continue in sin. These are our spiritual beatniks today. They don't follow any man or anything. They do as they please. May I say that both of these views have hurt Bible separation. I want you to look this morning at the separation of Daniel. I believe that in Daniel we have true separation, certainly Bible separation. And if this morning you can sing casually, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, then it might be well for you to understand what's implied, what it means to dare to be a Daniel what it means to stand alone for God today. Will you notice this man's separation? Daniel, the young man, carried away captive. And when Nebuchadnezzar first captured Jerusalem in 606 B.C., actually at that time he had no notion of destroying the city. He could have. But it was not until 18 years later that he destroyed the city, and in the meantime there had been two rebellions against him that led him to this extreme action. He only at this first time he deposed the king. He set his brother upon the throne, and he took into captivity at that time the choicest young man. He took those that had the highest IQ. The devil has always gone after the best. And I'm personally today jealous that the Lord gets the best. I don't see why we can't have more Christian workers with high IQs. What's wrong with dedicating brains to God occasionally? May I say to you, my beloved, we need that these days. And this man, Nebuchadnezzar, took the young man the choicest those with the highest IQ, those with the best personalities, those that were the most attractive. And among those was Daniel and his three companions. These four Hebrew children were the ones that went with the others into captivity at this time. Now, these four young men had been brought up under the Mosaic system. They had the Old Testament scriptures through Jeremiah. They found themselves in a foreign land, strange customs, pagan ways, and they were homesick. If you want to know how they felt, it's recorded for us, because the captives recorded their experience. In Psalm 137, will you listen to this? By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. For well, the other captives, 
I'm sorry to report they forgot Jerusalem. Many of them never returned, but there was one young man that during his entire long life never forgot Jerusalem, even when it meant endangering his life. It meant putting himself in a lion's den when he opened his window and prayed toward Jerusalem. He says, I'll never forget it. But he's homesick. And he's in a strange land. Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to brainwash these young men. He was to prepare them for service under his government. The idea was to take away from them all of their background, everything that was in their background, put new ideas, new philosophy in their thinking, and make them now servants of this great world government. He went so far as to change their names. We think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that's not their names. Their names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We ought to remember those names and not the others. The others are heathen and pagan names given to them. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. He actually changed their names. And he even changed their diet. You talk about changing a person, my friend. He intended to change them. And he even put them on a different diet. And we read in verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, this man, Daniel, made a bold request. In fact, it was one that jeopardized his very life, for he happened to be in the court of a man who was suffering from a form of insanity, as we shall see Thursday night, a well-known form today and a dangerous type of insanity. This man, at a moment's notice, could have given instruction to have put these young upstarts, these young whippersnappers, put them to death for not wanting to eat what the king provided for them, and after all, he was providing the very best for them. Now, this passage here is the standard text for Temperance Sunday. It's the stock in trade I can remember as a boy being in Sunday school and have the teacher go over this again and again and again. May I say to you that there's more involved here than drinking. It has to do with eating also. Be temperate in all things, the Scripture says. Now, what Daniel did was this. He respectfully requested for himself and his companions that they be put on a special diet. Daniel did not know the old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. After all, Rome wasn't yet in existence, but he didn't even know it as when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. And I want to say something else for him. He didn't give a lecture on the evils of drink. He could have, and believe me, Babylon needed it. And he didn't make himself otherwise obnoxious. He just purposed in his heart that he wouldn't eat that diet, that he'd be true to God. That's all. Oh, how we need today men and women who will purpose in their heart to be true to God. That's all. Now, God was with Daniel. Will you notice this? Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. I wish I could dwell on that this morning, but I must move on. Notice verse 10. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. You know, this official of Nebuchadnezzar really believed in that diet. 
He said, now, Daniel, I like you, and I'd love to cooperate with you, but suppose I permit you to go on a special diet. And then the day comes, after three years, that you are brought in before the king, and you are there with the rest of your companions, and they're fine-looking fellows because this is a great diet. And your companions here, they are fine-looking, and you're a little old anemic thing. You see what a position it had put me in. It would jeopardize my position. I can't do that. Now Daniel makes a fair request. Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, it was a fair request. It was an honest request. These young men are not juvenile delinquents that are rebelling against the law of the land. I want to make that very clear. They are not a gang from the east side in New York City or the east side in Los Angeles. They just respectfully request that they might be tested and see if the diet that they had asked for. Now, they asked for something that used to worry me a great deal. It was pulse. Has that ever bothered you? Pulse to eat. Actually, that is not quite the translation. The pulse to eat is some form of a cereal. It's some form of a grain. If I may bring it up today, Daniel says, I want my Wheaties. <laughs> now, if any of you all turn that into General Mills and they start using this, I hope you'll give part of the royalty to the building fund here. <laughs> I do not know why they haven't used this yet. That even Daniel ate cereal, that's what he's asking for. Now the question arises, what's wrong with the meat in Babylon? Is it contaminated? Is there something wrong with the meat? May I say to you, I think that they probably had the best filet mignons you could get anywhere in that day. There was nothing wrong with the meat in Babylon. We get our key in this statement here. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. And then he says to the prince of the eunuchs, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That's the key. This has to do with religious and ceremonial defilement. This young man has been brought up, I said a moment ago, under the Mosaic system. This young man has been brought up to read the Word of God and to understand that wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Daniel said, I'm following the word of God at any cost. This is not academic with me or forensic. This just happens to be reality with me. I intend to follow the Word of God. Now, what's wrong with the meat then? Well, the thing that's wrong with the meat is several things. The first is God had given to his people a line of demarcation between that which was clean and unclean that men and women might know from the days of the Old Testament down to the present hour, and especially in this day of latitudinarianism, that there is such thing as black and white, there is such a thing as right and wrong, there is such a thing as standing for something, believing something, and paying a price for it. Now, God had said to his people in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, 44th verse, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. Now, holy means set apart to God. That's all it meant in the Old Testament. For I am holy, neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, listen. 
For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the clean and the unclean, between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. Now God said that there were certain meats that could be eaten. God said that there are certain meats that cannot be eaten. That was the Old Testament legalistic system. It had to do with ceremony. It had to do with religious ritual. For God had given it. That was true of that day, and he intended it to be followed to the very latter. So Daniel said, I can't eat the meat of Babylon. God forbids me to eat it. Oh, I have a notion they one day maybe bring him stew. And gracious, all kinds of meat could be in the stew. Father said, he said, you know, I never eat stew away from home because I don't know what's in it. And he says, and I never eat it at home because I do know what's in it. <laughs> Daniel said, I'll eat no meat. I don't eat this which is contaminated. Now, there's another issue that's involved here. It was alive in Paul's day. It's not today. It was in Paul's day. All meats of those people were offered to idols. That was the curse of idolatry. Every bit of the meat was offered to idols. And Daniel said, I cannot have any part in that which has to do with idolatry. So he refused. He said that he could not drink the wine. I believe that all four of these Hebrew children were Nazarites. Back in the book of Numbers, I think it's the seventh chapter, you'll find the instructions there for the Nazarite. One of the three things that they were to do, they were not to drink wine or even get near it. I think Daniel and his three companions were Nazarites. They were separated unto God in this particular connection. And they did not believe that they should contaminate themselves. They were being obedient unto God. And they had Isaiah, and they knew Isaiah had said in the 52nd chapter of the 11th verse, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. And they wanted to be clean under God. Now somebody's going to say, are you suggesting today that separation is a matter of diet? And the answer is no. Somebody says, are we not delivered from this very thing in this age of grace? And the answer is yes. Because Paul very clearly makes the statement that Meat today has nothing in the world to do with our separation to God. Will you listen to him? In 1 Corinthians 10, 25, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Eat anything today. What you want to eat? They sell rattlesnake meat in San Antonio, Texas. They pack it. And if you want to eat it, you can eat it. But don't have me for dinner the day you serve it. I don't want it. But it's a matter of taste today. It has nothing to do with our separation to God. And Paul again to enforce this in 1 Corinthians 8, 8, but meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Meat has nothing to do with it today in this age of grace in which we live. What today is true Bible separation? Now, the tendency is to draw a line down on questionable things and be dogmatic about debatable things. I have a letter here that's quite revealing. It came to me several years ago from someone who started with us 
when we first began here on our midweek service. Listen to this. I've returned to California after a year of full-time Christian service in Ohio and an extended trip east, but I've come back almost spiritually shipwrecked, have been a Christian for three and one-half years, and until recently was able to give a glowing testimony about being saved out of unity. But lately I've been so dead that Christ seems way up there and I'm way down here. I have all the negative virtues of a Christian. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't play cards, I don't attend movies, I don't use makeup. But those things do not make a happy Christian. My friends tell me I'm becoming bitter, and oh, I don't want that to happen. Before becoming a Christian, I was very ambitious, worked hard for whatever I believed in, and incidentally was listed in who's who. But now I wonder, what's the use? May I say to you, that was a sad state that this party came to. Thank God she came out of it. And she's still a separated Christian. But I think she found out what true separation is. Will you listen very carefully? It was in those early ages of the church that they built monasteries. Those monasteries had a good motive at first. It was a protest against the licentiousness of the Roman Empire and the awful sin of that day. Men said, we want to withdraw from this. And they thought by just withdrawing, they solved their problems. And before long, it was worse on the inside of the monastery than it was on the outside. You know why? Because they weren't really separated. You remember Christ said to the Pharisees, the trouble with the Pharisees, he says, is that you make the outside of the cup clean, but the inside of it, is filled with corruption. A great many people think today, well, if I just don't do enough things, I'm a separated Christian, when their hearts may be far from God. My beloved, separation is not whitewashing the outside of a tomb. There's got to be life on the inside first of all. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. It's according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It means that he's done a work first of all on the inside, born from above. We must receive new life from God. We can't rub it on the outside. Listen to this. Daniel purposed in his heart that he had not defiled himself. He didn't make a little paper mache wall on the outside and says, now I won't be seeing you fellas. What he said was, in my heart, I'll be loyal to God. And then that will regulate my conduct on the outside. He said back in the Old Testament what Paul has said to you and me today. Therefore, I beg of you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, Why, God has been merciful to you, and he saved you. I beg of you, because he's been merciful to you, that ye yield. Same word as the sixth chapter. That ye yield. That's active. That is an act to the will, that ye yield your total personality. That's all you have, my friend, all you are. And if God doesn't have you, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't even want your pocketbook. He wants you. I beseech you, I beg of you, that ye yield your total personalities a living sacrifice, 
Oh, maybe we could all work ourselves up and go out here in the Colosseum and die this afternoon if we're thrown to the lions. But it's this old humdrum living tomorrow, Labor Day and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday that's the hard thing. A living sacrifice, holy, that is dedicated to God, acceptable unto God. God's encouraging us. He says, I want you to do this. You are the lost sinner, corrupt, ungodly that I have saved. And now it's acceptable for you to come and offer yourself to me if you purpose in your heart. And this is your reasonable, your rational, your intelligent, your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, this age, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Instead of being conformed, and Daniel, you see, said, I can't eat of it. I'm yielded to God. I purposed in my heart. I cannot be conformed to the court of Nebuchadnezzar. I want to be yielded to him. Daniel's experience is ours. We are captives in this world today in our bodies. And you can't serve God and mammon today, my friend. God hasn't given you rules. Don't misunderstand me. He's given you three great principles. I don't have time to deal with them this morning. But I can merely mention them. I just want to pass them on to you because they're so important. He has said, first of all, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Hasn't given you rules, but he's given us principles. And the great principle here is of conviction. Whatever a Christian does today, he should purpose in his heart. And that's the answer to all things that are questionable. If there's any question in your mind, it's wrong for you. We ought to do it with enthusiasm. You can go out here at the Coliseum and yell for the Dodgers till you're a horse. And they'll say, boy, isn't he a fan? You can stand up in the church of the open door and say, hooray for Jesus, and they'll call you a fanatic. We need today enthusiasm in what we do. You know it can be sinful to come to church this morning. It can be sinful to teach a Sunday school class. Be fully persuaded in your own mind about your conduct. It's wrong if you're not. Then will you notice the second thing? Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. There must be conviction. There must be conscience. Anything that a Christian looks back upon and has to say, I wonder if I should have done that, that's wrong for you. may not be for the next man. Don't criticize the next man. But my brother, it was wrong for you. It was wrong for you. Happy is he that condemneth not himself and that thing which he alloweth. Then the third principle, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And that's consideration. You know, friends, there may be something you can do that's all right. Let's not argue about right and wrong. I don't argue with folk about those things. Because that's not the basis today. Are you driving somebody away from Christ by doing it? Then, my friend, it's wrong. I have a friend that quit going to professional baseball. And I don't, oh, I hope you don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying he found out that there were a bunch of little boys following him. And he said, you know, in that crowd, I don't think I could win them for the Lord. Now, that's not for you. That was for him. You see, consideration of others. These are principles, not rules. You see, my friend, when you come to Jesus Christ, 
You come to the lover of your soul, and you're wedded to him, and you love him, and you're now trying to please him. Can you imagine a fellow getting married, and after the honeymoon is over, that he brings him to his wife into the kitchen, ten commandments that she's to follow? He better not, because the honeymoon will really be over. But suppose he comes in there and says, you shall not date any other fellas anymore. You shall cook my meals. Suppose he did a thing like that. I think it would break her heart. I think she'd say, I'm not going to date anybody else. I married you. I'm going to cook you meals, not because I have to, but because I want to. I love you. My friend today, Christian conduct, is not how far you can go before you're wrong. It's what you can do to please him. That's Christian conduct. And to be separated to him means Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Shall we pray? As we bow our heads this morning in prayer, we're coming today to the Lord's table. Every believer is invited to this table. None are excluded. But every man ought to search his own heart and examine his own heart. What kind of a believer are you today? Are you yielded to him? Therefore, I beg of you, my beloved brethren, that ye yield your total personalities as a living sacrifice. And that's your rational service and it'll be well-pleasing to God. May we this morning, in the quietness of this moment, as we come to the Lord's table, take that step of yielding ourselves afresh and anew to him, that is, if we mean it, if he is the lover of our souls, if our desire is to please him, rather than following some little mad man-made cliches. But today, we want our life to count for him. Our gracious, loving Father God, we do pray thou will seal to our hearts this day that which is true in thy word. And that which is not true, make it like the chaff upon the summer threshing floor that the wind shall drive away. But, O God, may thy word have its way with us as it did with Daniel. We do pray this morning that thou wilt enable us to examine ourselves and help us not to come here in a perfunctory manner today. We would pray it might mean a great deal to us. We would pray, Heavenly Father, if in our midst today there are those that know not this wonderful Christ who extends mercy to them that today they may by faith reach out and receive it. And then if there are those here today that are borderline Christians trying to go as far as they can and still maintain some sort of a Christian testimony, bring them to the place, O God, where they are willing to present themselves yield themselves completely and entirely to Thee. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.